Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, Season 3, Episode 6, with myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Hey. This week, guys, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with industry. Then, Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing our great friend, acting friend, Simon Berry, who's based in the UK, worked with us on many different projects, so we kind of wanted to get a bit of insight to his career. And uh, yeah, then we're also going to be discussing monsters slash creature features and what defines a monster within a monster movie. So without further ado, over to you, Sam, for industry. Now, I mentioned this a um, couple of months back and it was, it was kind of like a rumor. No one knew if it was definite, but it seems to have actually happened. Ari Lester will be working with Joaquin Phoenix on his next film. They're making a film called Disappointment Boulevard. And apparently, because no one really knows what it's about, everyone thought it might be this absurdist four-hour film he talk about, or it was from a conversion from one of his old short films. But there's um, some sort of storyline running around about the most successful billionaires fall and decline. So who knows? Who knows what it's going to be? Ari Lester, he could be going away from what he usually does, but I don't reckon so. That guy likes to disturb people. So we're going to get something quite interesting. Yeah, and, and Disappoint Disappointment Boulevard as a title is yeah. quite... Uh, Upbeat. Yeah. <laughs> Jesse Plemons, who was most recently seen in Judas and the Black Messiah and I'm Thinking of Ending Things, he seems to be everyone's favourite choice of the good directors. He was originally Jordan Peele's choice to be the co-lead with uh, Daniel Kaluuya, who was in Judas and was obviously in Get Out. <coughs> but instead he went for Scorsese's new film I was going to say I read something the other day that he's now been cast in a Scorsese film yeah it's interesting with this one because originally this was the role that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was going to have he was going to play the lead role but then DiCaprio decided I don't want to play the detective character I want to play the villain I want to play the bad guy I want to play the rich son from the rich family kind of that sort of thing. it was like okay that sounds kind of cool and Jesse Plemons has obviously worked with Scorsese before in The Irishman. But he's always a great character actor in the background. So I think it's going to be interesting to see him more as, you know, the lead. Mm. This could be a real breakout for him. Even though it would have been kind of cool that he's going to work with Jordan Peele. But maybe they will in the future. I think he's a good up-and-coming actor as well. I know he's probably, what, in his 30s? Must be, yeah. Yeah, yeah he seems to be getting cast in a lot of up-and-coming things. I've seen him in a lot recently. No, it's good. And he's got that crazy, quiet intensity. He's very good at doing that. Going back to the Jordan Peele film, so we have Daniel Kaluuya in the lead and Kiki Palmer, who is a, a new actress, and she's basically playing the antagonist. And that's all we know. We know it's going to be a horror movie because Jordan Peele's committed to making some horror movies. He's been given a big summer 2022 prime July release. But we know nothing else. That's the annoying thing with a lot of these announcements. We don't really know anything. We just know that they've been announced and that these great directors are doing something. Yeah. And finally, John Ridley, the um, writer of The Twelve Years a Slave, he's doing a film called Shirley, uh, which is about Shirley Krishholm, who was the first black woman in Congress, but this one's looking particular at her run for trying to be the Democrat leader. But the reason why it's kind of interesting, to me at least, is that Regina King who uh, most recently directed A Night in Miami and is probably going to get Oscar nominated for it. She also was in uh, Watchmen. She's um, playing the lead in it. So she's just on this like winning streak of like great, decent performances and coming towards her. So it's kind of cool. And um, there's been a lot of looking back at black history films that have been really strong recently. So it's always interesting to see another one, another point of history that you don't really know too much, especially as being, you know, English. Thank you Sam for industry. Now like I said before um, this week we decided to, well Sam decided to interview Simon Barry who's a very good friend of ours. He's worked with us on a lot of different projects and um, yeah he's based in the UK. So without further ado over to you Sam for that interview. This is not your typical interview I'll just say that. <laughs> I'm on Trash Arts Take with my very good friend and Actor that we love to work with, Simon Berry. How are you doing, man? I'm all right, mate. How's it going? Yeah, it's all right. It's, uh, it's quite a br uh, bright, beautiful day today, which is different. It is. 
Makes makes for well, change. I was vaccinated the other day as well, so I'm, I'm feeling positive about the life world. That's excellent to hear. Just one more jab to go. Yeah, I don't know when I'm going to get that one. We'll, we'll wait and see. Time will tell. So what made you want to be an actor? Oh, there's a big question. Um, originally, it was actually my mother who put me forward to the youth theatre because I was very shy and introverted. And I'd done a play at school. I played the Artful Dodger at, at age 11 or something. And my mum thought it would be good for me. And so she sent me to Dynamo Youth Theatre. So what led to and your... I turned out I was quite good at it. Oh, nice. What, what led to your first, um, like, acting film role? In film, the first film I did was, I don't know, but I don't know it must be 12 years ago, it must be more than that, because it was before um, Flummox was done. It started before Flummox was done. And that was just because a friend of mine <coughs> um, had asked me that he was making a film, he'd written a film. And that took something like two and a half years to um, complete, with various disasters along the way, until eventually me and the writer uh, ploughed on and got it finished. This... And we also met you during the filming of that, because um, <laughs> you were filming, like I say, Flummox at the same time. Is this the, uh, the time-travelling film? Uh, yes, never quite the same, it was called, yes. Tell us a bit about that film. Oh, wow. Like I say, it took about two and a half years to make that because the, 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 the guy who'd written it, Paul Vernon, he'd, he'd written a short story um, and wanted to get make it into a film. Um, so the problem started when the director and the cinematographer had a terrible falling out after um, the opening few two or three weeks of filming. Um, so bad so that the cinematographer left, taking the camera and all the footage and all the equipment with him. So I had to completely start again. And this was um, back, back on less expensive equipment. <laughs> that was back in uh, mini DV tapes as well, wasn't it? Which you can. <laughs> it probably was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would have been, yeah. As you said, it was a while ago. Yeah, as you said, this was around the same time that we first worked with each other in 2007 on my first feature film or my first film that was involved with being a director, Flummox. Yeah, that was, like I say, about two years later when we were actually almost finishing the film, we were finally getting to towards finishing the film, and we um, met with you and joined in with your film. Yeah, because we, we shot that rave scene where, like, you were there and there was a couple of the people from... Um... The cast, from our, yeah, the cast from our film were extras in your film, yeah. So with, with uh, Flummox, you play Chip Bartold Dollar. Um, yes. <laughs> I think like it was the first kind of film where you could see that you had a lot of range in your over characteristic characters like you can do very well <laughs> with big characters and it's a lot in the eyes and the, just the, the extra sort of um, theatricness to it which makes sense because you technically sort of come from theatre yes yeah yeah that, that, that's probably true so, like, after that, you did you did a couple of short films, and we, we started working with each other again about 2015. We did Bait, I believe, didn't we? Yes. Which, um... Which was, uh, <clears throat> Go on. I was going to say, yeah, that was uh, with Ross Allendoni, and, uh, yeah, we shot that in yeah. the summer of 2015. It's quite a long time ago now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But after that, you started doing more stuff with us, and then one particular role which... If you've ever been on IMDb and you've looked it up, people love him for it. It's right here, right now, with Marty. Yeah, 33 episodes. Yeah, you did a lot of episodes. Which we started off filming weekly, but discovered that we were physically unable to do that because it took up all the week. Yeah. Well, what made you want to go towards that character? Because I know like, I had my vision for who I thought the character was, and you ran with your vision. So why did you run with your vision? I think it's because originally when we were discussing the script ideas and we were discussing the idea, um, Jackson had, had the political ideas of, and you were saying about the comedy, but I, I, where was the comedy going to come from? And you said me, <laughs> <laughs> that I was going to be the comedy. And so therefore I thought, right, he's going to have to actually be funny and mm. he's going to have to be the, like, the core of the funny bits. And we'd be like, 
all the different things that are going to be going on and the more serious, subtle things, and then like performances and things like this, he's going to have to carry the humour, so he's going to have to be funny. So I, that was where he came from. So I thought, well, okay, let's make him funny. What, what's his problems in life? Were there any like particular like episodes that you really enjoyed doing of right here, right now? Oh my goodness, they were all fun to be honest. Um, it was a really good laugh. Uh, I think some of the we did some summer summer party episodes which involved quite a lot of people, different characters from all the different shows coming back together with musicians and all kinds of things. Some of that was quite was really excellent fun. Um, but when you're doing something like every month as well, you know, camaraderie going with your, your, your core members, everyone mm -hmm. knows their characters well. It's good fun. It's easy once you get into the. You know the character very well. I was thinking about Marty the other day, actually. I went, oh, I've not missed Marty. <laughs> it's been like three years being, like four years being Marty. <laughs> so it is a long time, and like I'm, I'm glad you guys kept the commitment a little bit. And yeah, the fact that people rewatch it and they really highlight your character makes me happy because by the end of the show, I kind of felt like actually Marty is the main character. It became the main character by accident, really. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jackson was very strict. He was never going to do the final year of Right Here, Right Now. It was always, I'll do this many years, I'm not doing your last year. <laughs> we, still, we still managed to get him to go like a comeback at the end. Yeah, we did. In between Right Here, Right Now, you were doing... Well, that was a bit of a spoiler for the script. Well, that was a story <laughs> spoiler. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. In between that, you were doing a lot of um, kind of found footage horror films. Um, two in particular, although one of them was later on, I wanted to talk about was uh, Lonely Hearts and The Unwanted, oh, yeah. which uh, you shot with Ryan in 2019 and was looking to come out later this year. Um, <clears throat> I had to think then that one's not come out yet. I no, that's why no. I can't remember that one. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> What's it like though, like doing that sort of format of um, performance? Because obviously it's all improvised, but. It's all supposed to be within that found footage kind of genre. We've done a lot of improvised stuff. Like oh, right here, right now, was entirely improvised, and so I think we've got quite used to it now. We've had a lot of practice, um, so it, it makes it much easier if you're if you're if you're used to it. And we often work with people we know already, so we can. It's quite easy to bounce off other actors if you've already worked with them before. You kind of know the kind of way they'll go with things. And so that kind of relationships we've built up over the years makes it easier. Lonely Hearts was, was was a bit more tricky for me because I was also supposed to be doing the sound. Yeah. From some, and like, as an actor who's, who'd never done sound for a film before, I appreciate that actually sounds quite hard. And um, <laughs> you shouldn't let actors loose on the sound <laughs> Cause, because one of the worst reviews we've ever had about the film is people occasionally will say, oh my God, the sound's terrible. <laughs> well, we we yeah, learned some me. lessons. Yeah, like putting batteries in the mic might help. They're definitely lessons. To, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so what was the other? What was it? Oh, oh, the other one was unwanted, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. Which I haven't actually like it's not finished yet, so I haven't got to see it yet. I'm quite looking forward to that one. See, by the point um, with that film, you obviously had done quite a lot of found footage kind of stuff, and like you said, it's all kind of improvised either way. Do you see any difference in how you'd perform for? being like all the sort of behind the scenes and you're supposed to be on camera to a regular sort of narrative, do you take any different approach? Or is it all just about the character? It, no, it's all about, to me, I, I, I talk about being in character. It's like knowing what the character is in your head and becoming them in your head. It's like, it doesn't really matter to me. Even when we're doing more formal stuff, I, I tend to stay in character out of line and stuff like that. I'll tend to be in character most of the time and have that going on in my head, so it, make, it doesn't really make much difference to me, it's the way I do it, so, which is handy, I suppose. Yeah. This leads us nicely into one of your most, um, well, best-reviewed characters that you've played for us. They're all, they're all well. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? As soon as you said what I thought you were going to say, that they were all well-reviewed, the sound cut off. So no one got to hear your uh, response there. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 they didn't. They just cut They're you off. Technical tissues. <laughs> yeah, I'm being cancelled. <laughs> but we're talking about the estate agent with the millennial killer. Talk a bit about how right. like that performance came across. Because obviously, 
you weren't the first choice to play the role. I wouldn't say first choice. It was more like <laughs> someone else was playing the role, yeah. but they weren't able to do fulfil all their commitments. So I stepped in at the last minute, saving the day, is how I'd put it. <laughs> <laughs> and you took like one step even further. You were like, I've got to make my hair look like it, just to make clear for some people who don't know. Simon has more hair than you see in The Millennial Killer. It's true. I don't actually have that haircut, no. Well, that was... Again, he he needed something to make him look a slightly older than I am, and also be just more nerdy. Yeah, yeah. I think it worked. It worked nicely, and I mean, like the the weird thing for me as a director of Millennial Killer is I feel a bit awkward about how some people take to the Millennial Killer. They love your performance so much and the charisma that they tend to think, yeah, he's in the right. And I'm like, that's not what we're trying to do here. He's totally mad. (laughs) (laughs) He's he's insane. (laughs) But the insane people, if you're, you can be very charming. Yeah, that's true. What kind of, nice. (laughs) As you as a performer, how does that feel to know that people will respond in a different way to how you wanted to, you know, portray him? I don't know, if, because for me, it's, it's how you want it to portray it. It's not really how I want to portray it, because I, it, it's kind of irrelevant to me. I want to make him as believable as possible. And yeah. so how people portray, see him, and how they view his actions, it's kind of, a, it's not up to me. As an actor, it, it's like, not even my brief to think about that. <laughs> That's your worry, not mine. That's a pretty professional attitude to take towards acting. <laughs> So you're, so you're talking know, like it? a professional, you know? <laughs> well, one of the good things about like, being brought up on, the, on on quite professional stage kind of um, world is that you, you do, like in the, the stage manager, for example, is far more important than you are as an actor when you're on stage. That's far more authority and then people listen to them much more than any actor. You're quite low down the, the list of important people as an actor on stage, so... So you take that it's quite a useful to mindset. Film. <laughs> Do you have any particular kind of characters that you enjoy playing? I don't know, actually. The variety is always good. I do like a bit of a psychopathic in the eyes because apparently I've got scary eyes. <laughs> what I want to have. Um, but uh, no, I like, I like the variety. Marty's not scary in the slightest, and he was great fun to play. Probably the least scary person in the world, actually. <laughs> Everyone punches him and things like Yeah, this is the thing. This is why, like, you do have a lot of range with your variety because you can clearly tell that you enjoy diving into playing different type of people. If the characters, yeah, and some characters are enjoyable, making those characters come to life. Mm. So you recently also directed. You directed a segment of our horror anthology, which is out later this year, Parasite Trauma. How did that compare to, like, you know... Not we obviously you acted in my segment, but with the one you directed, it was uh, you, Christian, and um, for some element, Sophie Atkinson. What was that like? Yeah, it's different to acting. It's much more difficult, I think. I'm not you. I, I'm not a director. I've never had any real experience, and you have to tell other people what to do, which I'm not very good at. I'm kind of much more like, oh, how will we do this all together, kind of thing. What made? And you... I'm sure that that. I was going to say that that part is supposed to be a horror film. Uh, what we made wasn't a horror film. It was more like a slightly sad, depressing little story about this lonely old man. I don't think I know how to do horror. But that's exactly what I wanted from the script. So you actually did what 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 was needed because we wanted to make the we wanted to make it more like it was drama, and then of course the horrors underneath there. But you still felt the emotions that the characters are going through. Yeah, it was much more emotional. I like the emotional bit. And a lot of people remember that particular like um, element <clears throat> with that particular story. And I think um, that's why it was it was interesting to say, why don't you direct it? Because I know you'd never directed before, but you were up for it. And because it was a small character focus thing, I had I think more... I did direct an episode of Right Here, Right Now, actually. We all, we all had yes, different yeah, yeah. turns or different aspects of Right Here, Right Now. We had all kinds of different people who'd have a go on sound and camera, so it can be quite different in each episode, but um, I'm sure I did a go at that as well, actually. 
I think that that probably helped as well that because we're right here right now like you said we tried to do quite a communal thing and everyone had the chance to do a bit of crewing a bit of acting it helped to know that you've at least had a step towards it especially as you were shooting with phones for Parasite Trauma yeah yeah which is also interesting <laughs> I, I, I'd probably be a little careful in like putting down like technical issues realising how difficult they are sometimes when you're directing <laughs> When you're an actor and someone says, oh, this is just going to happen, just like, react to it, it's easy. It's also, you've got to make this happen. Ah, oh. <laughs> making the Ouija board work was, took ages. <laughs> ages. But you got At least that. the cats acted properly, though. <laughs> right? At least Pat, the cat acted exactly as it was requested. Yeah, she was great in that scene. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what do you actually... I know, obviously, with everything going down, the roles haven't been screaming at the door but what what are things that you were working on beforehand or have recently been released what's what's going on right well obviously it's yeah we, we did a, a lockdown film in which we all played little bits of characters um again done on phones just on our own in our lockdowns in the first lockdown that was quite good fun that was like being a star but i can't remember what it was called <laughs> oh, you're, you, you're gonna be a star that was it that was good fun um, what's actually going to be happening? Well, yeah, I'm, now I'm vaccinated. We've got to wait about three or four weeks until the old antibodies kick in, and then we might start having a life again. But for the future, um, I don't know. What are we doing, Sam? <laughs> well, you might be working with other filmmakers that aren't just uh, trash arts. Um, unless they've got big, big wallets, that's unlikely. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the brutal honesty. <laughs> <laughs> if David Lynch comes calling, all right, I might. Always trying to encourage other filmmakers to work with you, and your response is always, are they going to pay me? <laughs> A true capitalist at heart. <laughs> well, because I like doing it with my friends. I, I like it's it's relaxed. We have a good time. It's, 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 I like the concept of what we, we do and the way we do it. So that makes me happy. In order to drag me out of that, you're going to have to... Uh, I have to cough up to get me out of my comfort zone. <laughs> oh, God. I'm going to ask you the question I ask everyone towards the end of the interview. Do you ever have a dream role? Like, is there a character you'd always wanted to play? Or um, it could be from, like, fiction, from books, comic books, whatever, or just a character that you just haven't had a chance to play? I always look at Simon Pegg, and he's about six months younger than me, and kind of go, I could have done that. <laughs> so your dream role is to be Simon Pegg well I should have been already <laughs> he should be me oh, I should have been him well <laughs> that's a no, different response honest, <laughs> thank you for joining me no, really. I, don't, I, don't, I don't mind we'll see what comes along shall we like, whatever comes along is going to be interesting so we can only we'll see hope. what comes along but yeah, thank you very much for joining me, Simon. Uh, you can catch Simon in Monstrous Disunion, which was recently released through Dark Side Releasing. And of course, we didn't yeah, even mention that one, did we? No, no, because because I felt like you've done a lot of cameo roles in a lot of films. If you you know, <laughs> you've done, <laughs> done yeah a lot of cameo roles. You can't talk about every cameo role, you know. All oh, right, you're making me sound like I'm a Christopher Lee of the world now. <laughs> Might end up playing a wizard at some point. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> this is not usually... Forgive it, greyer. Usually when I interview people, I don't think to myself, no, I restrict them from what they're allowed to talk about. This is a different experience. <laughs> Fair. On that note... I'll go away then. I'll go away then. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. And yeah, I'll uh, speak to you soon. Brilliant. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So thank you for that, Sam. A little bit different than... Our usual interviews, but still cute, very cute. Um, so this week, guys, we decided that we wanted to sort of look at what defines a creature feature um, slash monster movie. And really, there's two major points to it that we kind of agreed on, mm. was that you kind of have the monster movie where you've got the innocence and, you know, the person who's introduced to the apparent monster kind of is the only one that's on board and has like befriended the monster in some shape or form. And then anyone else outside of that, well, turns 
on this monster and then defines them as a monster. Or you have the other ones where it is very much they are a monster, they're here to be threatening, what can we do to stop it? So the first one that really jumps out at me would be King Kong. Because King Kong lives on its own habitat, does its own thing, and when the humans find it and interact with it, all of a sudden it becomes a monster because it starts fighting back and it doesn't want to be captured and become a caged animal and stuff. So yeah, I just think that's a really interesting idea of how you define a monster movie. Because King Kong isn't actually a monster. It's put into a vulnerable position, back against the wall, has to fight or fight. Well, yeah, it's kind of interesting because I, I think in a lot of the monster films, uh, the way that you the monster becomes defined as the monster is by public you know consensus in some ways the characters around them decide like they're a monster and whether they're right or wrong in that is uh, is another question well it's always face value as well because it's generally the description and look of the thing they go mm. that's what a monster is which means it must be bad to go further back than king kong probably your first monster movie is frankenstein's monster yeah who wasn't necessarily a bad guy you know he was a reanimated corpse trying to understand what humanity was and you know I think it's the idea of the fear of the unknown yeah. to a certain aspect because he's a reanimated, reanimated corpse. Can you say that? Um, and yeah, that's something that is the unknown, like bringing back the dead. Yeah. Like, that's considered not right, not cool. Well, that, that, I think that's an interesting thing with like the difference between like say King Kong type monster compared to yeah. a Frankenstein type monster is that. Um, you you've got the the uh, on the one hand like King Kong the sort of natural monster the monster that you know we go out and find in the, yeah, in the yeah. depths of some uh, you know forbidden region or something, um, whereas like with a with like a, a man made monster you've got that more fear of science and the fear of like what humanity is going to become in mm. the future and you know how we shape that with technology. Well, also with Frankenstein in particular, if you think of the mob that go against Frankenstein's monster, they're probably God-fearing, you know, it's playing God as well. Yeah. And monsters, it's a monstrous action by even tempting that idea, you know, or at least back then with that particular film. But that kind of model of that, is it a monster or is it just our reflection of seeing it as a monster, kind of like goes throughout movies from then on, you know? Yeah. And like you said, King Kong has a similar thing. Mm. And even in all the other iterations, like the 70s one and the um, Peter Jackson's one, they still go back to that idea. Mm. And the person who sort of um, epitomised that really is uh, Guamora de Toro. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, you know more about, uh, <laughs> about his career <laughs> than I do, Sam, if you wanted to take the reins on that one. <laughs> Well, there's there's one statement I always thought was interesting with Del Toro, and this is before he made um, The Shape of Water, that he'd watched the scene in The Creature of the Black Lagoon where the creature is like kind of swimming alongside and the woman's above. And it's supposed to be a scene where it's an intimidation thing, but he always saw it as they were like swimming together. Mm -hmm. And he never saw the monster as being the negative. It was just because of the appearance of it that, of course, people were supposed to go, oh my God, whereas he was like, oh, look at that. That's kind of beautiful. So he's always done that with his films. We think about Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's Labyrinth uses it in the sense of there's the fantastical world, but it, it, it kind of mirrors what's going on to some degree with the more fascist world that the um, main character's going through. He always uses fascism as the true monster. Again, something that he brings up in The Shape of Water with the FBI agent wanting to take down their love and all that kind of stuff. He's incredibly like strict, conservative Republican. And he's, and if you know, you just know that that's something that always plays in his mind is we take monster on the first value, then we just know better than the idea of what we think a monster is. Well, I mean, like you, you look at that and, and Pacific Rim and one of the things that really sticks out to me about that monster movie is that it was the, those, those monsters, those giant monsters that made uh, humanity sort of come together as yeah, one yeah. earth because they had to face this big thing that was much bigger than them. And, um, yeah, like, I think, yeah, he, he does sort of look at those kind of ideas of, of uh, anti-nationalism sort of nationalism quite a lot. It's interesting, but probably not including Specific Rim, but with the... Um, Pacific. Pacific Rim. I thought you said Specific Rim. No, Pacific Rim, <laughs> my accent. Um, but if you think about the uh, Demetrio del Toro films, and even King Kong, 
one of the major underlying factors within all of them films is love. Yeah. Yeah. And the love for well, one person in particular, or like you know, a little small group of people, whatever, their love for that creature, for that monster. But um, yeah, I just think that that's really interesting. It's like that even in dire straits when people are looking at specific things in a negative way, it, that's not always what it is. Like that negative thing isn't actually as negative as what people perceive it to be. The thing is, we see love as being something that is a human thing, yeah? And that like, that's what makes you not a beast because you can love. But in reality, love is something that is completely connected with nature and really, it's our one kind of pure, like one of the connections. Mm. So I think Del Toro kind of gets that a bit. There's, um, there's a film called um, Nightbreed by Clive Barker. Clive Barker is director of Hellraiser. And essentially, it's about a guy who discovers this underground of monsters. But the monsters, they all live on like the kind of outskirts of society. And they're all representations of obviously the ones who are ignored from society, especially in like the early 90s. And um, the one interesting thing about that is the monsters, they're all, they all look crazy and disgusting and freaky and stuff. And at first he's scared and then afterwards he spends some time with them and just realises that they're just trying to live. And that at the same time, there's a serial killer going around murdering these monsters. But he's human. But he wears a mask and he's psychically he pleased that he's a doctor. And he's a doctor who's supposed to be trying to help the guy, but he's actually trying to kill the monsters. Weirdly played by David Cronenberg, but he does a brilliant job doing that role. <laughs> he should play more serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> that's what your take on that was <laughs> but it was just interesting to see that they, because of knowing um, Clive Barker and how Hellraiser was supposed to be a reflection to some degree of like the S&M scene that was going on at that time but there's clearly a representation of these are the people that are ignored from society and they're living mm. on the outskirts and someone's trying to take them down one by one just because they're a bit different and obviously in this sense they're physically different as well and um it's nice to see monsters in that way because it's a good reminder to remember that monsters aren't real. Humans are more likely to be monsters. Yeah, and I think that quite often what what society has deemed to be monsters uh, needs to be questioned because, I mean, like, like you said, going back to looking at that kind of uh, uh, attitude of, you know, the homophobia in our, in our history, um, they would be seen as monsters by yeah. that society. And uh, so it's quite a useful metaphor in some ways, especially when exploring that side of it, to um, look at what society has deemed to be monstrous and, and try and gain a better understanding of it. Well, that leads really nicely into one of the bigger symbolic monster movies out there, Godzilla. Yeah. Godzilla is, you know, Japan's reaction and response to Hiroshima. Yeah. And it's really horrible when you think of it like that, because obviously Godzilla as an entity, there's like, 20, 30 Godzilla films now. The guy is his own franchise, you know? But when you think of the origins, this was almost like a political statement of how they felt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a nuclear bomb in itself is a huge explosion, but the crashness and the loudness of it being America at the same time kind of perfectly represents Godzilla. But it's not just that, it's also the environmental impact of it, because obviously Godzilla, from why, yeah, it's radiation. It's, he was a little yeah. lizard, and then the explosion turned him into a giant creature. And it again plays into a particular time when a lot of society was starting to think, oh shit, if we keep doing all these nuclear tests and stuff, are we going to get giant monsters? And you had a whole wave of these 50s films where you had giant ants, giant spiders, <laughs> just anything that they could go, right, put that, that'll work. And it kind of makes sense. You know, you, you sadly, obviously, Hollywood is a, sometimes a commercial machine. And capitalizing on fear is one of the easiest things you can do in society. So when you're doing it with those nuclear war kind of films, you sort of dilute the water and forget that Godzilla was more of a reactionary thing. Yeah, right? that's a big statement. Godzilla's an interesting one, though, because it kind of, for me, <clears throat> I think it's in between both categories. Because in a sense, it's man-made, but there's never really any empathy that is created yeah. for, like, Godzilla. No. And then it's a case of, Oh crap! We're we're humans. We gone fucked up here. We need to take this this lizard yeah. out, or else it's going to destroy us. Well, that's the thing, it's isn't it? Like that, you've got you've got the that that it's the kind of monster movie that where it's a monster and it's just clearly a monster, and there's not sort of a there's not a question mark above that. There's no like you know. I think there is at points like uh, definitely with the 
the 98 one. Like, oh, the, the Roland Emmerich one. Yeah, the Jamiroquai. <laughs> um, <laughs> classic. Yeah, like there's there's parts within that film towards the end where it's kind of like the morality of the um, characters start to question whether or not what they're doing is right. Like mm. they burn the whole nest, don't they, of all the little unborn lizards. Um, there is, a, like I think even whenever they bring down Godzilla in the end, there's that whole like intense moment where they're just looking into its eye and it's like having its last breaths and it's just breathing like very slowly and it kind of brings it back to reality. It's like, this is still a creature. This is still like, I was gonna say human. It's not human, it's a living thing. And because of our mistakes, we've put this creature into such a vulnerable position that now we've had to take it out. Well, you always find that point in a lot of monster movies, even King Kong. There's the famous line at the end that beauty killed the beast, you know, and it's just mm. seeing the body on the yeah. ground. It's not like, way. But then that's that difference, isn't it? They're not, those creatures were placed in a city, like I said, it's even nature or man-made, whatever. They're not attacking. It's not a monster attack, is it? It's more... It's monsters trying to get A to B and there's guns shooting it from all these different points. Yeah. Whereas it's kind of like, it's funny when you think of uh, Jurassic Park. I was about to say it. Because it's a, it's a weird line, right? Because they're not, they're genetically modified. They're not real. They're not from nature. They were put in an environment where they're supposed to be associated with the environment. Sam, not to disappoint, dinosaurs were real once upon a time. <laughs> they were real, of course, at <laughs> the time. Yeah. But, but you see, my, in, in my point here is that like, it's been put in an environment which is supposed to be associated with, but if you put humans in that environment still, you're fucked. Yeah. It's a, yeah, I think it's, it, it's sort of like between the, the, between those sort of two ideas of like reconstructing something from nature that mm. lives in the depths of history. Um, and sort of the folly of that and the way that, you know, that's going to lead to something bad happening. Well, it's almost, um, high evolution takes on its toll for a certain reason. You know, that's why dinosaurs aren't existing right now. And anything that we would consider to be like an ancestor of a dinosaur would be like a crocodile or you know an alligator, something like that, lizards, you know, a lot of cold blooded reptile. They've kind of changed in such a way, whereas they're not the dominant species anymore. So if you take that whole idea of, oh, let's put another dominant species in a contained environment. Yeah, we can control that. No, the inevitable is going to happen, isn't it? And yeah. That's what happens when you put probably like a, a bigger, what would you call it, food chain? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Creature. Well, it's also like a, a bit of a, and I think this goes, uh, is the case for a lot of the, the those kind of um, films that look at sort of humans it, it almost like invading their space kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, it's it's got that sort of... Uh, I mean, that's what humans have been doing for a very long time is yeah, like, yeah. you know, cutting down rainforests, building areas up and up and up. And uh, what has that caused? Loads of like diseases being found and stuff like that. That, that They're not these giant things, they're these tiny things, but like the metaphor is so much nicer with a giant uh, <laughs> yeah. creature in it. It's an interesting one, because if you tie that to like, um, when you do it for scares, rather than trying to make you think about those things. And I'm thinking of the, the descent. Yeah. Those, mm. those creatures inside there. I'm talking about part one. I don't know what about part two. There might be actual humans. I don't know. Part one. <laughs> They're horrible, scary creatures that live in the dark, but do, you know, eat their flesh and stuff. But with that, you don't, you feel like it's that classic thing, like you said, they're going into an environment that's not supposed to be theirs, but these things are predators. Mm. Rather than, you know, it's uh, an invasion of their place, it's human curiosity going yeah. into that place and being a that's what I meant also, there. Yeah. 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 And the, yeah, you can play it with horror quite nicely because yeah. you, it's a horrifying idea. You know, everyone thinks about that idea if they were in a jungle, they went a little bit too far and suddenly there's a species that no one knows about and it's going to kill them. Yeah. Maybe not everyone, but <laughs> I know I think about it. I think funny. if you were in that position, you wouldn't. <laughs> You'd be like, nope. It's I funny because it's almost like um, a terrestrial version of an alien film. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, where you're not going, you know, you're not going to another planet to find these things or these things aren't coming from another planet. They're just, they're already here. Um, yeah. There's always something scary about the idea that we don't know that there are other things out there on our own planet. Mm. And because we don't know what they are and if we saw them, they would be seen as kind of monstrous because it would be outside of our norm. I think that there's nothing 
massive, but I know that it's like unknown lizards or they can't go so far deep into the oceans. There's probably lots of creatures in the depths of the ocean yeah. that we aren't aware of that could actually probably be very, very fatal to human life. And it makes for perfect well, I think if you're down there, work. you're probably yeah, yeah. in a lot of trouble anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it just works but so well. We're pushing, if we take yeah. the point where we're pushing the boundaries of stuff, we're going to extra lengths to try and get to these places. Yeah. How long is it until we find the next killer spider or a blood-sucking lizard that will chew your face off? <laughs> you know, if you go too far into the rainforest... <laughs> That's the other interesting thing with monster movies. Because when you start talking about spiders, it made me think of um, Arachnophobia, which is a 90s spider film where a spider from another country comes to a small suburban city and basically spreads. <laughs> and it's everywhere. And it's, it's slightly a comedy film, but when you're a kid, it's fucking horrifying and you think that could happen to you. And in a weird way, it's kind of similar to Gremlins in some respect. It's bringing that thing to you. And I know, of course, Godzilla and all that do it on a bigger scale, but when you have that overtly over the top Americanized suburbia being attacked by this foreign thing, you get it's it's an interesting thing. I think what you're kind of specifying there is that with monster films, sometimes it doesn't have to be the big oh yeah it's the big creature the big bad creature kind of thing. But if something really small that spreads so quickly and can multiply so quickly. How quickly can it actually spread across yeah. the well, country? Yeah, to like, some that's degree. That's fearful in itself. But it's also just like we, we can make a monster movie where we're going into a scary, dangerous environment. And that's scary because we don't know where the bigger, horrible thing is coming. But we can also look at a monster movie of what would happen if this thing came to our city. Yeah. And obviously, unfortunately, we can all relate to that now <laughs> of something quite monstrous coming to your city. But um, yeah, I think no, it's I interesting. Know what you're, talking about. <laughs> well, you're right. When it's not one giant monster and it's a multitude of little ones, because they can go unseen for yeah. so long, it like, leads more to comedy. Unfortunately, you don't get that many serious things with lots of little monsters running around. It's always you're in the comedy genre. As soon as the monster's about this big, which is like the size of a ruler, it's comedy. I think it sort of plays into the the arrogance of humanity as well like the the, the characters like the you know the ones that bring the the, the gremlin um, yeah. back they're, they're so arrogant in the fact that they think oh, don't worry about the rules you know they're, uh, you know, they're not really that important they're just a thing you know rules aren't more like um, guidelines rules aren't for <laughs> us you know um, and there's consequences exactly and you get mischief instead of like you know complete carnage and like it's mischief they're having the time of their lives yeah and I think that is one of those things. When you're playing with mythological monsters, you're going to those sort of old mor morals and stuff. If you do this, the monster will turn up and it's going to have a time of its life. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Because <clears throat> mythology is another element with monsters that can... It's already got its basis there, but they're all just tales and warnings of don't do this, this is wrong. Perhaps don't do that. Or some of them are just in there where you're like, that's because it's from a very religious perspective you know <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think there's there's a lot of lessons to learn but i think it's about how you interpret it because like with with monster movies there's so much room for interpretation that you yeah. could make it like almost anything uh related to to say uh, i don't know um a pandemic or you could relate it to uh some kind of other like you know uh, people uh, I've lost my words. Let's not be around the bush. You just made a film called Monstrous Disunion. Yeah. We used monsters in a very particular way to reflect on a certain thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think you, you, like, you've always got to use the, uh, the monster as a metaphor for yeah. something. Otherwise, it's sort of just, uh, a, the, you know, it, it, it's meaningless, I think. Like, it's, it... I guess sometimes where uh, monster films can fall down and, you know, if you've just got a monster there for the sake of making a, a sort of a monster creature feature film I don't really think it hits like as far home as what other ones that do that actually stand for something so I'm thinking of Anaconda Anaconda to me doesn't jump out with any sort of reference no. it's just like a giant snake that starts eating and attacking people what if you think about I suppose Jaws Jaws is kind of like a bit more of a metaphor than well it's also the tension of it like you barely see Jaws yeah the thing is, there is like a whole, like everybody likes their worst movies here. Yeah. There is a whole thing of people love terrible shark movies, 
or terrible Shark spider show. Yeah, there, there's <laughs> so many now. Like tarantulas and sharks and octopuses have been multiplying to different species in some film franchises for way too long. Like uh, piranhas Dominic. as well. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> and it's because there's always this like cheap um, popcorn reaction to shock and awe. If you see a monster on screen, you're like, oh, look, it's a monster. And it brings you back to being about five years old. I love that we've gone from talking about monstrous to talking about like the worst monster scenes. So th- <laughs> thanks, guys. I'm joking. Great tie in. <laughs> but you see, what I mean, it's an easy thing to react to. That's why I always go a bit like, if I see when I watch the Godzilla and um, King Kong trailer, I'll go back and I'll be like, there's monsters fighting each other. That's why I love Pacific Rim. Nostalgia. Yeah, it's not, not, it's not nostalgia. It's just that seeing a giant thing fight something and it just reminds you, not so much in a nostalgic sense, but just the, you know, gods and bloody... It's, it's just classic in, in the very see, sense of big titans fighting each other. See, I think the opposite. Like, in that kind of sense, if I wanted big titans to fight each other, I'd prefer, like, uh, some sort of mythology with gods or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Where it's, like, high stakes, really impact... Whereas, um, like, the King Kong um, Godzilla trailer just doesn't do it for me. Well, I suppose think of it this way. Like, Godzilla and King Kong are the cinematic titans in regards to big monsters. They started it. They're, they're one of the first big monster movies. So, in the same way that you, you have that sort of tradition and mythology related to um, the Greek gods and all that kind of stuff, you have that now for Godzilla and King Kong. So if you're a fan, for instance, and if you watch them, you're going to think about all those other instances of the kind of fights they've had and think, oh, how are they going to fight? Is he going to shoot things out of his mouth? And it may, brings you back to being a child. And some part of cinema, especially blockbuster cinema, is supposed to make you feel innocent, like a child. That there's a glee of just going, oh, that was fun. We get it from action films. Speaking of the John Wick films. Yeah. He's running around, and you're just like, ah, ha, ha, ha. you forget about morality. You forget about any <laughs> sense of, oh my God, he's killed so many people. And sometimes in monster movies, you have to take that same sort of funness with it, you know? Or you can go the other way, like we said, deep as hell. I think yeah. if, you're, if you're into that kind of stuff, fair enough. But there is going to be people out there that aren't necessarily into that. Especially considering if you take King Kong and Godzilla, the amount of iterations that there's been of that, sometimes it gets to a point where it is a little bit stale. And I swear it was only like as recently as five, six years ago that they had one. That was Godzilla well, so versus King Kong. No, there's never no. been. There's never been there's a. Definitely one. There has never there. been an American mainstream version of Godzilla vs King Kong. There's, there's been two version. separate films that are in the same thing that's been building towards this film, in the last since 2014, the new iteration. You had Godzilla, then you had King Kong Skull Island, then you had Godzilla Two because I can't remember the second bit of it. <laughs> then you have King Kong vs Godzilla, so it's all linked. And it's never actually been done. And compared to some franchises, how many different iterations there's been, there hasn't been that many of Godzilla and King Kong. I mean, if you're in Japan, there's constant Godzilla. There's probably been an Americanization <laughs> since. There hasn't been that many. The last attempt was the 90s. That's quite a long time ago now. But I see your point. There is that fatigue to just going, oh, it's another monster movie. Because they're so iconic, you sort of think they're there the whole entire time. Yeah, and I think it has to... I, I lean more on the side of a monster film has to have some sort of underlying theme to it that is in relation to what could potentially be going on in reality right now or what may has happened in the past before that the film sort of expresses. And whenever it's a case of, obviously the film hasn't come out yet, so I could be completely wrong, but <clears throat> whenever it's just like Titan versus Titan, and there's no real underlying, I suppose you could have some underlying sort of idea to it but I don't know see, I'm just a bit I, I would say both personally like the thing is it, you're right it's good to see those kind of using it as a metaphor but at the same time like film is cinematic yeah and if you can shoot a monster fight with practical effects or whatever style you're doing it or it could be CGI it could be whatever mocap you're doing it well it's well directed and the score's perfect and the editing's perfect isn't that also what film's supposed to be so when you see two monsters fighting each other where they go, all right, we're not going to focus too much on the subplot. We're going to give you what you want. Sometimes I can sit back and go, let's go. It's going to be fun, you know? <laughs> and, and sometimes it's nice to have fun, but I also deeply love those deeper ones. It's good to have both. 
I think I think in in that like with those sort of big monster movies, fight, uh, big monsters fighting each other. I I like sort of moments of of something uh, more meaningful, something more metaphorical. But I, it doesn't have to be the substance of the film. It, no. it, you know, the substance of the film can still be the big like machines, you know, fighting monsters like in Pacific Rim. But like there, there's just these moments that sort of give you something a little bit more and a little bit like yeah. I'm I'm sort of a halfway between the two of you there. I think. Uh, yeah, like uh, that's just my opinion. I, <laughs> I, I kind of, I'll probably still watch it at the end of the day. You know, it's probably one of them ones that you do just like you say, Sam, just zone off and you watch it just for the sheer fact of what could potentially happen in the spectacle. I don't know. Adam Winsgard's directing it too, and he directed your next, the the guest. He's a good director. So I have faith that he's playing with his toys and has worked out how to make it work. <laughs> so, guys, we hope that you enjoyed our chat on monsters slash creature features. As ever, please leave a comment down below. Uh, let us know your kind of favourite monster films and uh, why. Also, leave a like. Please subscribe. Hit the bell to get notifications for more up-and-coming content from Trash Arts. And check out our website where we've got some brand new merch on there. That's www.trasharts.co.uk. Other than that, guys, thanks for listening. Trash Arts, take out. Ta-da. Bye.